Today on The Grave Talks, the exorcism of Cindy Sauer. Cindy Sauer appeared to be enjoying a good life. She was married to a loving husband, was the mother of three girls. A far cry from the title of the book that would later depict the following years of her life, The Exorcism of Cindy Sauer. Then things suddenly took a turn for the worst. In 2009, her husband took his own life very unexpectedly. She was overcome with grief, and as many would fall into depression. It was at this time that unexplained events began occurring around her home. She very quickly concluded that these may be paranormal in nature, possibly even her deceased husband attempting to leave a message. This assumption very quickly changed as things went from paranormal to sinister and possibly demonic. She suffered horrific nightmares, terrifying images presenting themselves night after night, depicting unspeakable atrocities. And then the haunting went from an external battle to an internal war that would require an exorcism. The exorcism of Cindy Sauer was one that did not end in one cleansing. The internal battle would continue for a time to come and would never permanently go away. On today's episode of The Grave Talks, we hear the personal story of the exorcism of Cindy Sauer from the woman herself, Cindy Sauer. When I was a kid, uh, the first um, interaction with anything paranormal that I can recall was when I was about five or six years old. And uh, I was sleeping in my bed. My sister and I, we shared a bed at the time. Uh, She woke me up and asked me, if I saw what she saw. She was really afraid, she was upset. She pointed to the the foot of the bed and there was a chair facing the foot of the bed. It happened to be my great grandmother's chair that she had had for years. Uh, She had passed away a few months earlier and we saw her sitting in that chair. Um, She had the dress on that she was buried in and she had a glow, it was almost a green sort of Um, luminescent glow that was just around her, almost an aura. And that was my first experience that I can recall um, vividly with anything paranormal. What was going through your mind as a little kid when when you saw your grandma there? Just what what exactly was was the the flow of of reasoning for this happening? It was absolute terror. When you're that young, you're trying to reconcile this. You know, you know that she has passed away. You were at the funeral. Everything is done, and you know everybody's still sad. And and then here she is sitting there. And you really, I didn't really understand, you know, the concept of ghost or spirit at that time. So I was confused, but at the same time, I was just terrified. We were both scared to death. Um, I'm not sure if I really knew how to, you know, how to take it in. And how to accept what was going on. But I I remember we just threw the covers over our heads and, and we stayed there until we fell asleep. And then the next morning we woke up and we we're like, you know, we did see this. We saw this and we told our grandmother and our mom and they actually believed us. Um, they, they didn't poo-poo us or say, no, you didn't see this. It was a dream. They really did take it in and they were, you know, pretty supportive about it. So it was a pretty interesting experience, especially to be at such a young age. When you share this experience with your family members, obviously it was nice to have someone to share it with, I guess. Um, So it wasn't just a one person thing and it could be poo pooed as, oh, you just, you know, had a bad dream. Did they give any any support of, well, you know, I've had similar experiences too, honey, or was it? No, it sounds like they were accepting of something happened, but was there any relating that occurred at that point? There actually was my mother and, and this sort of, I guess it runs in the family, this, um, I guess, intuitiveness or connection with things like this. Um, my mother had relayed to us a dream that she had had, and I'm not sure, I don't remember the specifics about the dream, but she had a dream and she was pregnant at the time, but she had a dream about my grandmother as well, my great grandmother. Um, so it, she, she described, you know, her being there and wanting to see the the baby, I guess, that she was about to have. So it was pretty interesting that she did relay that. So it, it wasn't, um, the whole situation wasn't something that was just exclusive to my sister and myself. And, and it was good to, to be able to experience that 
with someone because then you're not questioning yourself. Even at a young age, you could be like, well, you know, did I make this up or, or did I dream it? But knowing that there was, you know, evidence, you know, for us that we had experienced it and the other people experienced things, you know, it was a little bit comforting and it kind of helped us wrap our minds around it. And, and it became something that was, it was kind of normal for us, you know, the, the, the paranormal. And back then it wasn't the paranormal. You really didn't. We, I don't think we had a name for it. It was just something that, that we all were comfortable with mm-hmm. and that was a part of our lives. So, you know, there were different things that happened throughout, but, um, that first experience is one that really stands out in my mind. After you had that experience, uh, did did she ever come back again? Did you ever sense her or see her again as vividly as you did that day? No, I, we did not. I didn't personally. I, I That was my only experience with her. And um, after that, I think everybody sort of, you know, was able to move forward. And um, that, that was it as far as my great-grandmother goes. We... That was, I, I guess it was her way of maybe saying goodbye. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a comforting thing. You know, even though we were scared, obviously, it still wasn't, it, it wasn't, um, it didn't feel bad. It felt very benevolent, this situation, especially now being an adult and looking back on it. Um, you know, I know it wasn't anything threatening. And um, so it, it was, a, it gives you a sense of comfort now to know that she was just there to maybe watch over us and say goodbye. Moving forward into your childhood a little bit, you'd mentioned that that there were other paranormal encounters, not necessarily with her, but but other things that happened that made it not just such a, a one time experience with something from the other side. What were some of those other experiences that you had growing up? Well, it it sort of took a little bit of a darker turn um, at a at a certain point, um, and things you know, not weren't necessarily as, you know, as non-threatening. Um, there was one experience I had when my sister and I were in the bed, which again, it seems like a theme that we were, um, being a little bit noisy. Yeah. I think at this time I was probably around eight. Uh, we were being very noisy. So my dad would come in the room when we were being noisy and he would close the door, which left us in pitch darkness. Um, so we were, you know, doing our thing. And he came in and he says, okay, I'm closing the door. You guys are being too loud. And he shuts the door and we're still kind of giggling and, you know, having fun and doing, you know, just being girls. And I turn over on my right side away from her um, to try to go to sleep. And she's laying on her back behind me. And the door is, you know, over on the other side of her. So she's between the door and myself. Um, And I was laying there. I wanted to turn around and tell her something really quickly, even though it was dark. You know, I I turned to tell her something that I had thought about. And when I did and turned over, it was not her. Um, Her face had this, again, this kind of weird glow. I mean, I could see her face, even though it was dark. It had completely changed and stretched and it wasn't. It wasn't anything good. It was, for the for lack of a better word, it looked like a monster. Mm-hmm. Um, it was distorted and wrinkled, and there was this snarl, and the eyes were, you know, kind of slitted. Uh, it, was, it was frightening. It was, it was terrible. And I started to just scream at that point. I screamed and, you know, just went nuts. My dad came in the room. My sister's shaking me, wondering what's going on. And I look at her, and she's okay. Everything's fine. But that was... One of the next experiences that really, really stuck with me. Um, Years later, a friend of ours drew a picture of something that he had seen himself. And when he drew this picture out, it was actually, he was dating my sister at the time. It was the exact face that I had seen on her that night in our room. So kind of followed me throughout time. And that was a teenager when I saw this picture. So um, that, that was one of the more frightening experiences that I had. What do you think was the cause of some of the more frightening experiences when you go beyond your grandma? But when, when you were having an experience like that with your sister and the fact that that, that gentleman drew that photo uh, or that picture uh, of something very similar to what you saw, also involving your sister, uh, what was what do you think the source was? Was it the house? Was it a person? Was it an object? I mean, looking back in hindsight, what, what, what is your conclusion on that? Well, looking back now and knowing some of the history that I've kind of gone through with my family and um, doing some research, 
and some other things that have happened that we'll get to as well. I really think that it's not, it wasn't the house, of course. It was sort of um, our, and I don't want to say an ability, but maybe our sensitivity mm -hmm. to things. Um, you know, I guess when there are good things, the bad things can also be attracted. Uh, you know, the, the energy in the house wasn't the best at times for, for you know, several reasons. And um, I think that when you're in a situation like that, that there are many things that can play into it to sort of, you know, create these situations. Uh, doing some of the research that I've done on the property, the land itself, there are some indicators uh, that things are a little bit different in, in this area as far as the land goes. And it being, um, you know, dating back to some pretty ancient, um, um, just maybe some native um, connections and also some slave connections. Uh, there was a graveyard actually in the yard uh, that was unmarked. For the most part, it had some crude um, headstones made out of rocks and a little bit of carving on it. But after researching, finding out that that was likely a slave burial area mm -hmm. um, that was still in the yard. So, you know, there's that connection to it. And when you're looking for answers, you're never going to, you know, you really can't find anything concrete when, when you're trying to, to research stuff like this. But I think it's sort of um, maybe an indicator on why things took a darker turn, sure. uh, you know, with the land and then our history, our family history as well. There are darker things that are, you know, well in the past before I was born as well that I've um, begun to dig up. So it, it might just be create this this perfect storm for things to to happen. And, you know, I'm still searching for answers. So um, that's sort of where I'm at with that. Sure. When you were a child, did you realize, did the family even realize that some of the crude markers in the yard were, in fact, uh, gravestones? Or, or what, what was it even looked as? Um, at first, we did not. But there was a certain time, you know, because there were places where it was sunken in. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the earth was sunken in pretty, pretty deep. And there were these perfect, you know, long areas that were big enough to you know to be a coffin um we didn't put two and two together at first we were digging around in this area because it, it had grown into a grove of trees at that point and you know digging around and pulling leaves back and looking and we found this this um rectangular piece of granite because in the area it's full of granite there are a lot of granite outcroppings and actually some a couple of big granite um structures that are called mountains that they're so big um, so we turned this one piece of granite over and it actually had engraved on it M-A-M-A. Um, -M -A -M -A. And so that's when we sort of put two and two together and it was right on top of where one of the holes was. So um, after and then after doing some research, finding out about the slaves in the area, the blacksmith shop that was over um, the place where my house was and the fact that slaves were. You know, slaves' quarters re were usually in that area, and they would bury their dead, of course, close by. Sure. So we, we sort of put two and two together for that. It's an interesting thing with, with the gravestones of, of the slaves. Uh, a lot of folks would not even put two and two together of what some of those markings are. I've actually seen yes. some in an antique store once. <laughs> wow. And I just thought, really? that's the worst thing you could possibly sell in an antique store. Uh, and and But I also thought they probably have no idea what that is. Um, and I don't think many would uh, unless they're aware of what they, you know, somewhat historically look like. And, and, and they, there can be variations to them. But I think a lot of times when folks think of, of gravestones, their their image is very much Halloween gravestones <laughs> or, oh, absolutely. or things of that nature. And they're, these are very nondescript, often times just initials um and and yes. and very you know very uh, th th there was no money to do it people were not they, the yeah. way that they were treated the the owners weren't going to put the money into it and and they didn't have the resources to do it so the markers can be very nondescript um let's move forward a little bit further as the time you got into being a younger adult still interested in the paranormal what uh, what did you get into at that point as far as uh, investigating or, or or your interest there I was absolutely into it. And, you know, everything as a child just fueled, you know, that that want to, to investigate more, to dig more. And, um, you know, before the Internet, 
uh, we, I largely went to the library and I read a lot of books and I was always in that one section where you had the few ghost books <laughs> and the, the UFO books and the cryptid books. And I would sit and read these like just religiously. It was, yeah, I, I was very captivated by all of it. Um, and when I got a little bit older, uh, you know, there were, there were, uh, again, things sort of went into, in a, in a, in a negative direction. Um, it really started you know, as an adult and I did do some, you know, amateur investigating before any of the big shows came out before ghost hunters or anything like that. Sure. You know, we would have, we would take our a recorder and a digital camera because that's when digital cameras were the big thing. Yep. And, um, some friends and I would go to, um, some places and just check it out. And, and it was pretty interesting. You know, it was fun. It was, it still had that sort of air of mystery to it that, it, that I think is lost, you know, uh, largely the, you know, it, in modern days, it's just not what it used to be, but we did that. Um, never really had any sort of, um, you know, real major experiences, a little bit of evidence here and there, but nothing major. Um, it wasn't until I got to, you know, to be, you know, maybe about 10 years ago is when things started to really pick up as far as activity and, you know, my experience with paranormal goes. Um, I would have things happen in my house, things move around and you would hear things, see things, you know, n nothing major, just out of the corner of your eye. And, um, it, it sort of became a normal thing. So I was used to it. I've been used to it my whole life. Just, just having things happen. Didn't think anything of it. Um, we had some tragedy that happened in 2009. My husband actually committed suicide. Um, so, you know, that was a big blow mm -hmm. and, uh, it took a bit to get through it after he did die. You know, my kids and I did experience, we started to experience things around the house. Um, at first, you know, we would see things, we would see shadows. I would see really large shadows sometimes go from one room to the other. Um, my daughter actually saw my husband standing outside one day. Um, and I went to confront whatever because she was very scared. She was upset. She said he looked angry. And I go to confront whatever or him or whatever. And I have something thrown at me um, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the yard. And this lug nut comes flying out of nowhere and past my head and lands on the ground. And so, you know, I had that experience. Uh, soon after that, things started to fall off the walls. We had some religious items that would fall off the walls and break. Uh, a Bible that went across the room. The pages were ripped out. Um, things would were really starting to get active at that point. And um, we, you know, I, I didn't really, you sort of are disconnected from it in a way because we were still grieving. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm thinking maybe, you know, I think we're all thinking you know, maybe it's just him trying to trying to tell us something. And as much as you don't, at that point, we weren't. I, I wasn't in the place where I wanted to have that contact mm -hmm. at that point. But you know, I thought if he's trying this hard, and I'm just ignoring that, maybe this is what it is. And um, so, you know, we sort of dealt with it. There were some days we didn't want to go home. <laughs> you know, we would leave and not want to come back because we were scared. Sure. And it was just myself and my kids. You know, we. After he died, we lost a lot of family and friends. You know, it was a very difficult situation. So we were, um, you know, kind of by ourselves and didn't really have a big support system at that point. Um, so, you know, progressed and, and I made some new friends. There was a person that I was going to start doing some, you know, amateur investigating again because I thought if this is going to happen, I may as well start getting back into this, you know, mm -hmm. and just kind of see where it takes me. Well, um, there was a house that I had been really eyeing to do this for a couple of years. And so I decided it would be a good opportunity. It was about fall. It was, it was around this time of year, a little bit later. And it was in 2011. And I decided it might be a good time to go and check this house out. It was abandoned, really big house. It was amazing, beautiful place. So I took this friend and we decided to go check it out during the day. And we went in and, you know, just got an idea of the layout of the house. I did have an experience when I walked in 
uh, of something or someone standing at the bottom of uh, the stairs going into the basement. And it was a very dark shadow. The basement itself was dark, but this was darker than than the dark around around it, you know. And um, uh, we, we did go check this out. Didn't find anything down there. No one was there. So, you know, we, we got a, a feel for the house and we left and we decided to come back that night. And so we we went back that night. I had reservations. I remember driving back to the house. Um, I really, there was something nagging at me that I really did not want to go into this place. I did not want to to even go up the driveway, but you fight it off. You think maybe you're just, you know, you're just being scared. Your nerves are getting the better of you. Mm-hmm. It's nothing major, it'll pass. So we go up the driveway and we park and we get out, you know, just like we had the day before or earlier that day. And there's a um, a street lamp that's in the yard uh, by the house. And so we parked underneath that. So we get out of the car and make our way around to the back where we got in earlier that day. Um, I immediately felt really pensive and like I did not want to be doing this. And I remember even questioning, you know, I don't know if I want to go in. I, I'm not sure. I thought if I felt this bad outside, I'm not sure that I really want to, you know, actually go in the house. So um, the further we pressed on toward the back of the house, the more uneasy I got. And I remember seeing something just darting around us, you know, from from like tree to tree and bush to bush. And it was really, really rapid movement. And it seemed like that things started to pick up, like everything was sort of moving. You know, that's what it felt like to me. It felt like that that there were just there were just things moving all around. Um, we I think we're back there a few minutes and never made it to the back of the house where we got in. And I was just too jumpy. Um, and I heard a car pull into the driveway. It was a gravel drive. And so we were like, okay, we're caught. We need to go back, you know, out and get out of here. But when we went around to the car, you know, our car, there was no one there. So, you know, we we just stopped for a minute and I'm still feeling really, really agitated and uneasy. And this, this feeling of energy picking up everywhere was just, it got more intense. And I was hearing things and it was jump, you know, it was very jumpy. I was very, um, very edgy. And, uh, you know, the, the person that was with me just kept pushing like, well, let's do an EVP session. Let's ask what's going on. Let's see who this is. And I'm just like, I really think that, you know, it's not a good idea. Um, I immediately got cold, um, started to shake. My teeth were chattering. I was really uncomfortable at this point. And, um, this, whatever it was that was around was just moving more rapid. The movement just seemed like it was more and more intense. And I was you know, it was, it was really pressing in on me. And there was one point when I hear something behind me and I feel, I feel like there's something behind me. Um, there was a grove of trees, you know, pretty large trees, oak trees and pecan trees behind me. And I knew there was something back there. I, you could hear it. You could, it was, it was something huge, just pushing through, you know, trees. And I turn around to, to see face whatever this is and the trees that were behind us started to just twist almost like there was something coming through these trees and it was big it, it had to be 30 to 40 feet tall like this this thing was massive mm-hmm. and it was it was like vapor it was like if if you're you know looking at a road uh, on a hot day the 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 vapor that's coming up from this was there that this thing was that big and I looked at it and it was coming at me and um so my first thought was to get in the car I had to get in the car and the car door was locked and I kept pulling and I was like I need to get in and let me in let me in and tried to get in but this thing hit me before I could get in the car and it it, it, when it did, you know, I, I did I did get in and it was just behind me, like at my shoulder, just screaming. And it wasn't a scream like a, you know, an audible scream that you hear, but it's inside my head and it's screaming. And I just sink to the floorboard 
to try to get away and just cover my ears and we just get out as fast as we can. Um, we stopped at the end of the driveway and, um, you know, we sat there for a minute and I was, I was extremely upset at this point and I started to get really disoriented and I was sort of confused at this point. And um, I remember thinking, you know, that whatever this is, it was bad, but I couldn't make sense of things. And that's when I asked the person with me to pray because I knew something was really wrong. And when he started to pray is my body got really rigid and stiff and my stomach was pushed up. I was in the seat distorted, sort of in a, in a, like an upside down U shape where my stomach was pressed up toward the, the roof of the car. Um, I'm not sure how long it's, I stayed that way, but, um, after a few minutes it released and I just sat still and, um, for some reason it, I just said, well, that was weird. Just the, the oddest thing to come out of my mouth. Um, we, we left then and went, you know, down the road a little bit, but I had to get out of the car. I felt sick. So we stopped in, in a parking lot and I get out of the car and I'm still really disoriented and I'm um, having a hard time making sense of anything. And, uh, I was sort of pacing back and forth and I kept thinking I wanted to go back to this place. Like something was pulling me back to this place. And, um, they started to ask me questions and I kept thinking, why are they asking me these questions? What, what, you know, very irritated, very pissed off, basically that they're sitting asking me stupid questions like, who am I and what's my name? And, um, I, I just continued to get more agitated and I stood against the car and they asked me to pray. And when they asked me to pray or say, Jesus, this hiss came out of me. And, and it was like, it was something that I could never have made a sound I could never have made. And it was at that moment when I realized that there was something really bad inside of me. Um, it got worse from there that, that first, and I call it an attack. Um, because I don't know what else to call it. And that first one, I'm not, I'm, I'm unclear about how long it lasted, but it eventually did let go and I was able to, to get control again. And I think we made it home and it was probably daybreak when we finally got back to my house. My house was only about 15 minutes away, but it, it was, it, the whole entire incident was, was a prolonged incident. And um, I went home thinking, my God, I had just come across, you know, like a demon. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was pretty upset. It took me a few days to recover from that. It, it was uh, it was draining emotionally and physically. I was spent and, and I was a mess for, for quite a while. So that that's when things really started to um, take a take a really negative turn. And I want to go there. I mean, that has to be quite a, a realization because uh, you having interest in the paranormal, having read books, seen shows, all of that uh, as to what existed at that time. You knew what what someone who was possessed might theoretically act like or, or, or feel yeah. like from those things. And it's, it's yes. quite often, I would think, something where. Oh, well, that that happens to those people over there uh, that, you know, that, that you yeah. must be really into something dark to, to have that happen to you. Um, but then to have that all thrust upon you and oh, my God, I'm the one in this place now and I'm the one that's acting this way. And my friends are looking at me as I've seen or heard how people would be reacting to seeing someone who would be possibly possessed. That's got to be quite a thing to to take in and process. You are exactly right. And I think that's one of the one of the issues that people don't realize when you're dealing with things like this is that there is so much that goes with it. And there there is a certain stigma that's attached to it that, oh, this person is a devil worshiper mm -hmm. or, you know, they they are into dark things. And the thing is, with, with my experience with the paranormal, I it was something that I largely avoided. I didn't look into, you know, demonology mm -hmm. and um, all this stuff. It, it honestly, it just terrified me. Yeah. 
you know, it scared me to death. So I avoided it. If it, if it, if I, if I didn't look into it, then I wasn't in danger. It didn't exist. It wasn't going to bother me. Mm -hmm. So if it was real, if by chance it was real, then it, it, you know, I wouldn't be affected by it. So, and, and then people around you, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of, of guilt that you carry and, and it's shame mm -hmm. for having, you know, been this way in front of people and for people having to, you know, deal with this and, and having to live with it as well. It's, it's a very difficult burden to carry that people don't consider the, the, the shunning and, and, you know, the, the disbelief, because it's hard to believe it's a hard thing to swallow and people do don't want to accept it largely out of fear yeah and then secondly because it's like oh it's movies it's tv it's not real you know and um so there, there's a even in the field today you know everybody's a demon expert mm -hmm. everybody knows what to do but nobody really knows what to do no and people want to think oh that you know that you can that they're familiars or there's certain things that i i, I just I don't agree because I, I have had to be attached to these things. And so it, it's a completely different thing when, when it's real. And, you know, I, I don't, I never thought that would happen. It's something, who, who plans that? Who thinks? Who even can, can see that that's going to happen? You, you can't. And then when it does, what do you do? You know, that, that's, there's a huge gap between you know, like this happening and what the heck do you do after? Like, how do you deal with it? And and as big as the field has gotten and as much as people want to think that they have answers, it's just not, it's it's very lacking in this in this situation. There there really aren't answers for it. But um, yeah, the, those are big things, yeah. you know, the people around you and, and, and how it's dealt with. It's huge. Very uncharted territory for even the, the so-called experts out there. How did you continue into that territory? What happened after that incident? Well, I, you know, when, when it happened, we were, I was really hanging on the hope that it was just an isolated incident, that I had gone to this place and stirred something up and that... You know, despite the things that had happened at the house, you know, I was still in largely in denial about anything that had happened, you know, at my home. And I just was was praying, okay, look, this this is just isolated. It happened. It's terrible. It 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 was a horrible experience. I'm gonna move past it and, and I'm gonna pick myself up and um just kind of forget it and things are gonna be okay. And so, you know, that's that's where my mindset was immediately after, you know, as soon as I had a few days to recover, because like I said, it, it took a while. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, you know, I was, I was just, just kind of following that train of thought. And then, um, then it, it's, I, I, I saw a few weeks later that it, it was not an isolated incident and that it was at my home. And I, there was a there was a, a shadow, a thing, outside one night, and it came at me, and very much like it did at the other house. It wasn't as big, it was different, but it, it did come at me and knocked me down. And that's when I realized that something had maybe followed me. You know, I still I still was in denial about what was happening. I still I still did not want this to be. I still could not accept it. So I thought, okay, something followed me from this house to my house. So it, the, the, you know, your thought process changes, you know, it's not an isolated incident, but I'm going to deal with this the best I can. And so, you know, I just, I prayed a lot. Um, I continued to get more depressed. Uh, I was upset and, um, it, you know, I just, I'm still a mother with with kids I've got to take care of. So you you're you're doing this balance between you know dealing with this emotionally and then you know still being a mom. Mm -hmm. Still having to work, still you know doing everything that you have to do. And um it 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 just continued. Things things started to progress. Um they were at first a lot of external things happened. Um shadows, things going by windows. Um, 
things moving, cabinets open and close, and the dryer door opening and shutting rapidly back and forth just several times. Things going missing. Um, again, religious items. You, I, they were they were always a, a target. Um, I, I started to get where I would put things away. Um, religious items, just put them away because they were going to get destroyed. Mm-hmm. I, I would get physically grabbed um, pretty forcefully. Uh, I got scratched. And yet I still was at the place where I was like, this, this is not happening. You know, that this thing has followed me and we're going to get rid of this. Um, but it turned from external to internal pretty quickly. And when I say internal, I mean hearing these things speak to me um, and thinking things that were not my thoughts, um, saying things that I didn't, you know, um, as cliche as it sounds, that were that were a different language. Um and having thoughts that about people, people, what they were thinking, you know, I, I would tell people to stop praying and get very angry, like, don't pray. And they're like, we're not praying. You're not, they're not speaking. They're not you know, saying anything, but they were praying. They were praying silently and it would make me very angry, but I would know it. And um, they would tell me things like this person hates you. They're, they're trying to ruin you and destroy you. You need to distance yourself from them or this, you know, just, these things would start to happen at that point. I still didn't know what these things were, what these voices were, what these thoughts were. Um, I knew it was bad. Uh, There were times that I would really want to hurt people. And um, I would have these vivid images in my head, my head of, of, you know, doing these things. I had never acted on them. You know, I'm just naturally, I'm not, I've never been a violent person. I've never, you know, I've never, I'm very empathic. So, you know, I'm, I'm just gentle. That's just all how I've always been. So this was very foreign to me to have these thoughts. Um, and this all happened within weeks. It progressed that quickly. Uh, I started to hear, um, in, I would lay in bed at night, hear knocking and scratching on the inside of my walls. Um, on the ceiling, I would hear it. I would hear growls and hisses coming from the corners of my room. And it was just absolutely terrifying. You know, I couldn't sleep. It was hard to sleep. I would stay awake and just, just be petrified because I was so scared. I didn't, I I didn't know what to do. I couldn't see these things, but they were there and they just got closer and more prevalent and they got into me more and more and would take over more often. I had more attacks. Um, I had one where I actually punched myself in the face. Um, I had... Uh, several j- just that weren't you know pre- weren't overwhelming attacks but they would take over and I would be doing like normal chores but it wouldn't be me it, it, w- it was it was not me and my body movements would change just the way that I moved the way that my facial expressions were were very different and my eyes would change and I could feel it, but there was nothing I could do. I would just be pushed back sort of mm-hmm. inside myself. And and I wasn't able to do anything. I couldn't reach out and tell anybody to help me because there was nothing I could do. And um, so it, things just, con- it, it continued to spiral like this. There were a few people who knew what was happening that you know I confided in that would be around that were helpful but for the most part you know you keep it to yourself because what what you don't know what's going on so how do you tell people what's going on that wraps up part one of our interview with cindy sour about her haunting story in part two of our interview with cindy sour we discuss some of the darker family chapters that she learned about on her journey of healing. We also hear in-depth accounts of what it was like to have a demonic force exercised out of her and the struggle to keep the force away for good. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thank you for listening.